Robert Sigrist, the murdered couple's son, was the first suspect. At the age of 21 at the time, he wasn't exactly a model lad, but neither was he very difficult. He grew up in a quintessentially average Swiss family, where the husband dutifully went to work bringing home the bacon, while the mother, as we have heard, meticulously maintained the household, keeping everything ship-shape. She handled the cleaning, cooking, ironing and children with an air of contentment, even finding joy in her role as a homemaker, rarely ever complaining something that is, one might be tempted to say, difficult to believe in 2024. The Robert school years passed without any noteworthy hiccups. He earned the respect from his peers and got along with most everybody in the neighbourhood. However, by the age of 15, and in the spirit of the times and with the Beatles and Rolling Stones setting new trends, his hair grew longer and longer, much to the annoyance of many but not his parents, who accepted it with a smile. Things were slightly different at school, but his prowess in mathematics, far exceeding the norm, left his teachers with little leverage against him. His hair cascading past his shoulders and him wearing bell-buttoned jeans, he often found himself labelled a hippie and was routinely subjected to scrutiny, especially during ticket inspections on public transport. But Robert found it quite amusing, presenting his valid ticket with a broad smile. He then basically cruised through adolescence just like any other teenager of his era, socializing with girls, frequenting bars and rock concerts, drinking beer and smoking cigarettes, all without ever running afoul of the law. Upon reaching the end of his schooling, enticed by his stellar math grades, he sought an apprenticeship at the local bank. However, his refusal to cut his hair led to repeated rejections from banks that insisted on a more conventional appearance. Undeterred, he opted instead for an apprenticeship as a local lab technician. Unfortunately, neither the working environment nor the task at hand suited him, prompting his departure after a mere three months. Shortly thereafter, he found employment at a trading company, successfully completing his apprenticeship in 1974. It was around this time that he crossed paths with his later wife, Anita. Introducing her to his family, she was met with open arms, and likewise he was warmly welcomed by her parents. Plans for a shared future quickly took shape as the young couple spent their days and weekends together, alternating between his parents' city abode and Anita's family home in the countryside. But then, on the Pentecost weekend in June 76, tragedy struck and their lives took an altogether different path. This is Suspects and Motives, episode 3 of The Seven Murder Mystery, produced, written and hosted by me, Rudolf Eisler. The presumption of innocence applies. Having discovered the five dead bodies at the cabin in Seven, it did not take too long for the police to establish the identity of the victims. Nearly everyone in the village, but especially people living close to the cabin, knew the murdered couple. And because nearly 90% of all homicides have a relationship background in some way or another, the investigators did not lose any time to locate the dead couple's son, Robert. Judith, his sister, having found and identified the victims, and having produced an alibi was quickly ruled out as a possible suspect. Contrary to her brother Robert, she was never available for an interview to me. She never talked to anyone about the case and wishes to keep it that way, she told me in a brief telephone conversation. Something she did not do on the fatal Sunday when the investigators had difficulties locating her brother Robert at his parents' house in Basel. 
It was her that told the police that he most likely could be found at his girlfriend's Anita in Helstein. Half an hour later, two policemen, dressed in civilian clothes, pulled up in front of Robert's girlfriend's house. Here is Robert's account of what then happened. Wir haben Pfingstsonntag 1976. Da bin ich mit meiner damaligen Freundin und späteren Ehefrau. It was Pentecost Sunday in 1976. I was with my girlfriend at her parents' house in Holstein, in the Waldenburg Valley. Her parents were away for the weekend, so we were alone. In the afternoon, it must have been around 4 p.m., we heard noises in the house. Our room was on the ground floor, and soon we noticed noises from the outside. Suddenly, someone was knocking frantically against the door, and the handle was being forced down several times. Then someone shouted, Police! Open the door! We were scared to death and didn't know what was going on. When I recovered from the initial shock, I shouted back, Police! Then they showed me an ID. We then turned around and noticed a hand on the window displaying an ID on the outside. But all we could see was the ID in his trembling fingers pressed against the window pane. We couldn't see a person. This scared us even more. But in the end, I had no choice but to open the door. A man wearing jeans and a jean jacket came rushing in. He pointed a gun at me and shouted, Hands up against the wall! I was convinced the whole thing was a setup that they were burglars who were about to rob and kill us. I raised my arms, turned to the wall, spread my legs, and was searched. When I asked what was going on, and would he please explain what this was all about, he ignored me. By that time, his colleague had joined us, and minutes later, my girlfriend and I were led away separately. I was taken to the police office in Listel, and my girlfriend to Sissach. None of them ever told me why or what for. When they were let out of the house, he noticed about a dozen policemen and several police cars in the streets. Again, he inquired for the reason of their arrest. And again, no one cared to answer. Later, during the interrogation, he was presented a typewritten paper which stated an acute risk of concealment or conclusion. The investigator had the suspicion that Robert could destroy or alter evidence or influence witnesses and work out a detailed matching alibi with his girlfriend. This may be so, but it did not justify the way the two youngsters were treated and questioned, let alone not telling him why they were taken into custody. I was questioned for hours, by sometimes four people at the same time, and repeatedly urged to confess, even before I knew what had happened. It wasn't until late Sunday evening that I was finally informed that my parents had been the victims of a terrible murder. There was no trace of sympathy or condolences. All they said was, if this all turned out to be a mistake, they would apologize. They never did. The initial round of interrogation drew to a close well past the stroke of midnight. By 7 a.m. on Monday morning, he found himself roused from slumber only to plunge back into the relentless questioning. Later that day, Robert was escorted into a van bound for his parents' home. For at least two hours, the apartment underwent an exhaustive search. Carpets were upturned, paintings removed, shelves emptied and curtains distangled. In the kitchen, the contents of the garbage bin were strewn across the floor as officers meticulously inspected every empty can and crumpled or torn piece of paper. The while Anita marked her 20th birthday within the confines of a cell in Sissach, bereft of sustenance or solace for a full 24 hours. It was obvious that the authorities' primary objective was to corroborate Robert's testimony and alibi before turning their attention to her, hoping to establish discrepancies in her account. 
And while in custody, the police diligently verified Robert's alibi, to their astonishment finding it to be ironclad. The proprietor of a bakery in Hölstein came forth, attesting to having encountered Robert and Anita within his establishment on Saturday. Even the conductor of the local Waldenburg Railway, making a brief halt in Hölstein, provided testimony in their favor. Come evening they had attended a comedy performance at the Basel Theatre, easily substantiating their attendance, presenting the tickets and even remembering the sequence of the comedian's sketches. Finally, after two days of detainment, Robert and Anita were released. Without having received a detailed explanation from the police regarding the events at the cabin and his parents' deaths, Robert headed straight for the nearest newsstand, purchasing every available newspaper. Another single publication failed to spotlight the grisly killings on its front page. For the first time, he learned about the details of this horrific murder. In tears and anger, he ran home to his parents' empty apartment. And amidst the chaos the investigators left behind, Robert noticed Anita's birthday cake still standing untouched on the kitchen table. This must all be a bad dream, he thought. But it was not. It was real. No one lit the candles or sang a birthday song, and instead of laughter filling the air, all that could be heard was Robert weeping silently. The ensuing days were a whirlwind of press calls and visits. The case had gained such widespread attention that journalists from as far as Germany and France showed up at Robert's doorstep. Meanwhile, the investigators continued to keep a close watch on him. On one occasion, they arrived requesting his immediate company, having been assured that it wasn't another arrest and that they would be back shortly. Robert agreed and found himself seated in the back of their car, destination unknown. For nearly an hour they drove about, again withholding any explanation. Eventually they returned to his home, leaving him none the wiser. Only much later did Robert learn the purpose of their excursion. The police retraced segments of the perpetrator's route in his father's Opel Escona after he had committed the crime. Scrutinizing Robert's demeanor and reactions, especially so as they slowly passed the exact spot where the abandoned car was discovered. But Robert, not being familiar with the location, sat absent-mindedly in the back of the car. Later, when Robert started to clean up and rearrange his parents' home, where he still lived, he brought some clothes to the dry cleaner around the corner. When he went back to pick them up a few days later, he was informed that the police had confiscated them for examination before they could be cleaned and had not yet returned them. But neither the owner of the dry cleaner nor the employee did know him. It was therefore impossible that any of them had called the police. Hence, it was obvious that even after his release, the police had continued to shadow him. Despite all efforts to keep the funeral a secret, some reporters and photographers of the Swiss tabloids showed up and relentlessly took photographs from a distance. Additionally, two policemen stood somewhat offside and carefully watched the mourning party. His parents had the wish to be cremated, but the prosecutor objected, explaining that an exhumation must be possible at all time, something Robert and his sister agreed upon. The next day, the funeral coverage made it to the front pages. But the only substantial content it included was that Robert did not cry at the grave and that his sister was wearing a yellow dress. For the press, this was reason enough to question especially his innocence once again. The 
their lingering doubts remained palpable when the investigators talked to their neighbors and friends once again, especially inquiring about the relationship between Robert and his father. But it soon became clear that even though they did have some arguments and disagreements, there was never a substantial long-lasting dispute between them. And even if, certainly none that would have caused Robert to plan and carry out such an atrocious act. So with Robert moving down on the suspect list, the investigators redirected their focus towards other potential suspects, particularly to those with ties to either of the victims. Among them was Robert's cousin, a rather peculiar figure named Adolf Sigrist, affectionately known as Johnny, standing at a diminutive stature of only 150 centimeter, or approximately 5 foot. Johnny possessed a high-pitched, almost feminine voice, earning him attention and often a pitiful smile in local circles. He was frequently referred to by derogatory nicknames such as Dölfli or Globby, a Swiss bird-like children's book protagonist, reflecting negatively on his already perceived inferiority complex. Some assumed that this, together with his not having been fully accepted by the Sigrist family, could have played a part in his motive for killing the victims. Also residing in Basel, Johnny, 40 years of age at the time, led a solitary existence, was a known weapons enthusiast and frequently displaying a short temper. His distinct appearance and gnome-like character made him a well-known figure in the area's social scene and eateries. It was also soon established that he was related to the victims, being Robert's cousin and Eugene's nephew. The police, having established the murder weapon being a Winchester rifle, the investigators, as we have heard, concentrated their initial inquiries on arms dealerships, especially the ones located in the Greater Basel area. One such establishment was R. Meyer Limited. Being questioned by the police investigators, the store clerk disclosed the identities of not only all known Winchester customers, but also supplied his sales books, which listed all the ammunition that went over the counter, including the type, date, amount, and the customer's name. Now, upon scrutinizing the records, the police soon came across Johnny Sigrist, not as a Winchester owner, but as a purchaser of ammunition. Bearing the identical last name as the victims and having bought Winchester rounds, this seemed suspicious. It provided crucial information that linked Johnny to the murder and propelled him into the spotlight. He was being arrested and questioned at the police headquarters in Basel. I was fortunate enough to locate the employee that nearly 50 years ago sold the ammunition to Johnny Segrist. He was 24 years old then and still recalls the events of the time in detail. Not because he has an extraordinary memory, he says, but because he had to recount the events a great many times in the past years. Today he lives in a village outside of Basel, not far from Seven and runs a restaurant in a large country house, including an arm shop and indoor shooting range in the basement. He agreed to meet me and share the detailed account of his encounter with Johnny once again. So I set out on a splendid spring day in March 2024 and reached his establishment about an hour later. I entered the reception hall and followed the sign that pointed to the basement. A wide spiral staircase led down to a shop where he sat behind a desk covered with paperwork, handguns, boxes of cartridges and a rifle scope. 
He did not lose much time. Ask me to sit down and did not mind me recording his Ich bin dort damals als äh, beim Waffengeschäft Meier äh, 1975, äh, nachdem wir... Äh, I was employed at the Meyer gun store at the time and 24 years old. I had already become acquainted with Adolf, or Johnny Seacrest, before I commenced my employment there. He would frequent our gun shop sporadically. Additionally, he was also a member of a combat group that convened for shooting exercises near Sieven on occasion. His presence caught my attention not only due to his diminutive stature and high-pitched voice, but also because of his special outfit, a green U.S. Army jacket and fisherman's hat, while driving about the area on his moped. Roughly a month prior to the crime, the aforementioned Johnny visited our Basel store inquiring about a rare 38 Special 200 gram Super Police cartridge, a relatively hefty ammunition manufactured by Winchester and Remington. I informed him that we did not carry it in stock, but I could order it. He then asked me again if it would fit into an Italian Winchester replica. We proceeded to order two boxes of 50 rounds each after my assurance that they indeed were compatible. Approximately two weeks later, he returned to collect the ammunition. Once again, I found myself reassuring him regarding its compatibility with the firearm. I recorded the transaction in our ledger and he signed for it, settled payment, and left. This concluded the matter for me. Then again, about two weeks later, shortly after the murder, I think it was on Tuesday, a representative of the Basel Criminal Investigation Department showed up at the store and asked about customers we knew who owned a Winchester or a replica. I gave him the ledger of ammunition sales, which he took along and said it would be returned after examination. The next day, he returned with the book to the store, put it on the counter, and opened it. He pointed with his finger to the signature of Johnny Segrist. Do you know this man, he asked me. Yes, of course, I replied. I know Johnny. Why? He waved it off and said, just curious, forget it, and left. By Friday the same week, the result of the forensic laboratory in Zurich was made public for the first time. It seemed possible that the weapon used was not a handgun, but a lever-action rifle. For example, a Winchester or Winchester replica. The same day, a reporter from the local newspaper stormed into our store and asked permission to take a picture of a similar Winchester we had for sale. The next day, the picture was in the newspaper, and with it, the headline, The murder weapon was a Winchester. Still, I didn't make any connection between the crime and the ammunition sold. The following Sunday morning, precisely one week after the murder, an investigator called me at home and ordered me to retrieve the ledger from the shop once more and promptly bring it to police headquarters. Less than an hour later, I made my way down the long corridor in the police station. Walking down the aisle, I suddenly heard a distinct and familiar high-pitched voice. I couldn't resist the temptation to peek through the open door into the room where the man was undergoing questioning. And then it dawned on me. Before the investigators explained why they summoned me with the book again, I put two and two together. Was Adolf Johnny Segrist somehow involved in the murder? It was him that had bought this 38 Special ammunition and explicitly asked about its compatibility with the Italian-made replica. I was absolutely certain of that. The search of Johnny's flat and colored styrofoam heads that had been shot through. His explanation was that he used those for target practice at shooting ranges. When questioned about his whereabouts on the Saturday of the murders, Johnny claimed to have gone fishing alone. And as unbelievable as it may sound, because lacking substantial evidence to detain him any longer, and because Johnny was in poor condition, suffering from diabetes and other health issues, the police were compelled to release him after only two weeks. Many years later, he and Robert crossed paths for the first time. According to Robert, Johnny vehemently maintained his innocence regarding the murder. 
Nevertheless, Johnny's involvement in the case persisted in the collective memory, with speculations surrounding potential motives, including his strained relationship with the Sigrist family. Johnny passed away in 1985 due to kidney failure. Yet, as subsequent evidence emerged, as we will see in a later episode, his name continued to surface in connection with this perplexing case. And as usual, when a case comes to near standstill and no new evidence emerges, the Savan murder became a breeding ground for new theories and investigators looked at the possibility that the murder or murderers may after all not have been linked to a family issue. One of these theories centered on the assumption that not Eugene and his wife were the main targets of the murder, but Eugene's sister, the 80-year-old Anna Westhäuser. What led them to the assumption was that when the police searched the old lady's villa near Seven, they were rather surprised to have found a portrait of Adolf Hitler hanging on the wall behind her bed. Further Nazi memorabilia was discovered in drawers and cupboards. Researching her past, the investigators established that Anna Sigrist, Eugene's older sister, was born 1896 and left Switzerland in 1920 to marry a German musician by the name of Westhäuser in Berlin, a man that was known as a national socialist and admirer of Adolf Hitler. From this marriage emerged two sons, Emmanuel, 1924, and Max, 1927. Anna returned to Switzerland after the war and her husband's death. Even though being described as a rather dominant and bossy woman, she led a modest and inconspicuous life with both her single sons living with her. Yet some parties suspected that there could be a connection to the old Nazi regime. A theory that was fueled again decades later when the police discovered further evidence that pointed in a similar direction, but more on that later. But was it conceivable that this was after all not an ordinary relationship offence, but a late settlement in some connection with the German Nazi regime? It seems a rather far-fetched theory, but be that as it may, it cannot be ruled out. A second, in my view, even weaker theory was that the murders had a connection to industrial espionage, simply because Eugene Sigrist was working for a Swiss multinational healthcare company. But it being so speculative and unsupported, I will not cover it in any more detail. Fact is that by early 1977, or a year and a half after the murders, over 9,000 leads were followed up in the course of the investigation. 3,007 owners of Winchester weapons were questioned and their rifles analyzed. 27 homes searched, 21 suspects examined, and 9 people remanded in custody. A side effect of the investigation was that a total of 10 crimes were solved that had no connection to this murder at all. The investigators still had no suspect, no murder weapon, and the motive remained a mystery. They cleared their offices at the restaurant and reduced the manpower that dealt with the case by half. Max Jecki, one of the leading investigators, however, remained tied to the case until his retirement. He kept on questioning people and followed up on tips that were still incoming in years after the crime. What he and the investigators did not know was that there was a time, in late 1976, when they were closer to solving the crime than they realized and with a little more consistence and thorough investigative police work would have discovered a few irregularities that would have led them to a man 
they only brought in connection with the murder 20 years later. In 1996, lead number 9424 of the Saven murder case was opened and it contained something so sensational and promising that investigator Max Yaki had to work overtime again. But this time, he was convinced that the murder would be solved soon. Make sure to tune in to episode 4 lead number 9424 of the Save and Murder Mystery, when we'll hear in detail about the truly sensational new discovery, a game-changer that will keep you as alert and on your toes as it did investigator Moksiecki 50 years ago. This was The Suspects of Motives, Episode 3 of The Save and the Murder Mystery, an investigative true crime podcast by Playground Media Productions, produced, written and hosted by Rudolf Eisler. Available on Apple Podcasts or any platform of your preference. Please do visit our website at SwissMurderMysteries.com for additional information including maps, rare police photographs, and details on how to support the creators of this podcast. 